Podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. and listeners. It is my pleasure to welcome you to episode 6 of the Thor's Hermes podcast. This episode has been brought to you on July the 2nd, 2017. My name is Rudolf and I'm the host of this show. I do hope you will enjoy your stay with us today. At the center of this episode you will be able to listen to an extensive interview with American author and occultist Paul Joseph Rovelli. The music we will play during today's episode is also featuring him. Paul is also a professional musician, writer and vocalist, and you will hear him in those diverse capacities. As usual, We'll also bring to you two interesting pieces of news and a review of an exciting new book release. Please don't forget to visit our website www.thoshermes.com that is T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S dot com there you can find all the information you need regarding what you hear in the podcast. You can reread reviews and news. And of course, you have also access to all previous episodes. You can listen to Thor's Hermes podcast directly from on the website or in an individual app player. But of course, also on Blueberry, iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Android, and several other podcasts, apps, listing Thor's Hermes. When you go on the website, I would like to ask you to go and discover also the artwork of our featured artist. Thor's Hermes is proud to support and present artists working in the occult and esoteric realms. At the moment, you can find the works of Stuart Littlejohn, and Stuart is also part of today's book review. And now, some feedback. The Thoth Hermes community is steadily growing. Thank you all who have become regular listeners. We have reached 4,000 downloads and this is really making me happy. Do continue to spread the word it would be great to see this venture reaching always new audiences. I don't want to keep you for too long with my personal business, but I assume many of you have either read or heard my short announcement a few days ago. Yes, I have had an extremely tight professional schedule, which will be ongoing for the next month or so, and therefore Thor's Hermes will, as it has been the case for this episode, experience some irregularities in regards to its release dates. All will return back to normal mid-August, but until then you just might want to subscribe on the Toth Hermes website to our email newsletter on Facebook or on Twitter, so you can be sure to be informed when the new episode will come out. Thank you for all your kind reactions when I told you about my workload. It is so nice to know that many out there are paying attention and are expecting the new episodes, but also do understand when sometimes real life takes over. 
This was a very good experience for me. Thanks again. Also, this time, I will be looking forward to receive your feedback. You can contact me, as always, through the contact form on the website, via Facebook, Twitter or email. I would also like to point out once again that you can leave a voicemail via SpeechPipe from the website, and for free, of course. Just click on the tab saying Send Voicemail that should appear on the right edge of your browser window and follow the instructions. And then you might hear your voice talking to me directly on the next episode. Finally, I would like to repeat my request for you listeners that live nearby to get in touch. So that is people from Austria or close by. I would really get to know you all better, and that would be nice a start. Now, let's commence this episode with the first piece of music. I present to you the rock band Joy, with a recording from the early 90s. Joy was Paul Joseph Rovelli's, our interview guest's, last rock band, composed by himself at the keyboard and as vocalist, Keith Carrigan guitar, Jim McCauley bass, and Glenn Meyer drums. The song they play for us, written and composed by Paul, is called Lady Finger. Lady Finger! Lady Finger, a song written by the guest of our upcoming interview, Paul Joseph Rovelli, and performed by himself and his last rock band, Joy. You can find the lyrics on the music page of the Thos Hermes website. Here comes the interview. So... After having heard him sing and play music, 
We will now hear our lengthy interview with Paul Joseph Rovelli. He talks to us about his childhood and youth, about his first occult experiences which occurred in his neighborhood, and then his first and very quickly very intense contacts with the OTO and the Lima. He talks briefly about this rather famous controversy with the OTO Caliphate and what this meant for his further development in the AA and the Gnostic Church. Just a quick note here before we start the interview. The Caliphate we are talking about here means an American branch of the OTO, the Ordo Templis Orientis, which was founded in 1977, but not some more contemporary usage of the word. Also, I would suggest that if you're interested to know more about those early years of Paul's activity, go to the Thos Hermes website, where on the show notes you will find a very interesting link with a documentation about all this. But now, let's start talking to the director of the Gnostic Church of Lux in upstate New York, Paul Joseph Rovelli. Welcome, Paul Joseph Ravelli. Welcome to Thoth Hormis podcast. I'm very happy to have you with us here tonight. Welcome with us here. And it's good afternoon from this end and certainly good evening to you. Thank you. I'm very happy to have you with us because you are some very important figure in the Western mystical tradition. Before we enter into more detail into things about OTO, Thelema, Gnostic Mass, etc., I wanted to ask you if you could give us a bit of your personal background. How have you become what you are today? Well, I mean, I came from a very religious family, so I was a devout Roman Catholic as a child. Uh, went to church a year earlier than we were supposed to. Uh, used to read the Bible to my family. Uh, I went through a uh, conversion in my teen years when I read the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Right after that, I read some stuff on the occult. I remember this one book called The Occult, and I just liked the word. <laughs> I remember asking my neighbor, what is this Kabbalah thing? And, and he was Jewish. And he turned pale white and just went, that's mysticism. <laughs> I thought it frightened him. So a long journey from there, obviously, but it's just a part of who I have always been. So you had the spiritual being inside yourself all the time? Yes. I mean, I think I, I became very concerned with things at a very young age. My relationship with the church went from one of accepting its authority as a child to my teenage years questioning that authority. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the heels of the 60s as I'm doing that. You know, I turned 13 in 1973. And so the 60s are done, but they're still lingering. And I'm trying to figure out whether my thoughts are my own or whether they were put into my head by my parents and church. Later on, I came to realize I was also having other interesting experiences. As a child, I can remember walking home uh, like from grade school, which wasn't that long of a walk. It was about two and a half blocks uh, you know, in length. But I can remember hearing uh, the Beatles' Nowhere Man in my head. Mm -hmm. And I could hear the four-part harmony. I think they call that synesthesia. So I became very, very interested in the mind. And uh, I remember my neighbor Mitchell, that was Mr. Falk's son. That, that was the gentleman that I asked about the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And Mitchell was a couple years older than me. But I remember him talking about sitting in class and, like, having his mind on different levels at the same time. Uh, he could hear the, the lesson being taught, but he could think about, you know, some other subject that he wanted had running through his mind while thinking about yet something else, like whether, you know, he was hungry or whatever. And, and I became very intrigued with the mind and, you know, whether my thoughts were mine and what else could I do with this mind? Mm -hmm. And when did it become obvious to your surroundings, to, to your parents maybe, or to other people, that you were 
maybe not so devout a Catholic anymore and were thinking about other types of spirituality? Well, I can remember, because I always talked to my mother about my situation, and as I started to think about leaving the church, which, you know, just was anathema for my mother, Mm -hmm. she suggested that I go see my favorite priest, and he used to do the high mass at noon every Sunday, so I would start attending the high masses, and I loved the extra pomp and circumstance, Mm -hmm. and he was a really down-to-earth, you know, fat, roly-poly kind of guy with a cigar, And he didn't mind cursing, you know, so I'd go hang out in the rectory with him after church and ask him all my little metaphysical questions. And, you know, he'd sit there with his cigar and, you know, he he was as freewheeling as anyone else from New Jersey, just saying fuck all the time. You know, so it's like, (laughs) listen, you know, you got to fucking whack the pfeffer, but that's what it is, you know, so you got to do these things. And he was really kind of like that. And I liked him for his down to earth uh, genuineness. How old was he then? I probably around 15 myself. Right. Eventually, neither he nor this other priest that I would talk to inadvertently, because now by now I'm reading Herman Hess novels and, mm-hmm. and all the American transcendentalists, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I loved Nathaniel Hawthorne. Right. Um, you know, and I had a little Shakespeare under my belt by this point, too. Uh, I remember hitchhiking in town, and the other priest picked me up, and we talked about uh, the Herman Hess novels, and he was just, oh, that's, uh, you know, just uh, imaginative extravagance or something like that. I, I don't remember his exact words. That was the final blow. I, that was it. I was leaving the church. Uh, I was going to not go to church for the first Sunday of my entire life from like four years old to this point. You know, I began that struggle of really asking whether my thoughts were my own. And I got involved in the countercultural ideas and was exploring consciousness the way anyone out of the 60s would have explored the consciousness, uh, as well as, you know, reading, absorbing, uh, you know, thinking, writing, creating. I, I went through a whole range of uh, approaches. But did you pick them up by yourself? Did you just read them and think about them? Or did you have influences by people you met, by currents that you experienced at that age already? I always met remarkable people, you know, in many different ways and in many different parts of the spectrum of my interests. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, being a child, and I used to talk to the two old ladies that lived on the street, Mrs. Lynch and Mrs. Clark. Their mm-hmm. husbands were long dead. They were like, you know, like in their 80s. They were the first Roman Catholics to move into a Protestant neighborhood. Right. And their homes were both firebombed. You know, so I got to have sophisticated conversations with them. And I remember a really old man who used to walk around with a cane. And for two summers I saw him, he would take a walk around the block. I didn't know exactly where he lived, but he took that walk every summer evening. And we would chat. can't remember specific conversations, but I was intrigued with his elderliness. Mm-hmm. And he had a glow of wisdom. Uh, you know, in seventh grade... I'm now like 11 years old, uh, 10 or 11 years old. My grandfather died, and that was my first source of wisdom. I still think my grandfather's the holiest man that ever lived today, and he was a Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was, I guess I was seeking ways to reconnect. But I've always been good. I think Saturn's very prominent in my chart, and I'm always good with people that are older than me. I even started school a year earlier than I should have. Age. So I was always, you know, never really comfortable with anyone my age. I think we must be the same age because when you mentioned uh, you were 13 in 73, so you're born in 1960, if I got that right. That's correct. So am I. So I know the time a bit, even if in Europe probably it was a bit different. When I prepared for today's interview, I saw if my information is right, that you connected for the first time with OTO and Lima in 1986, so at age 26. So yes. Before we go into that, can you describe a bit that time, the years before, and your spiritual interest and development in those years? Were they specific to some direction, or were they just all over the place, or how did that go? 
No, that I, that was already like a second or third step in a process. Uh, in college, my best friend was also the guitar player in my band, and his mother used to go to school with us, and often the three of us would have lunch. Mm-hmm. And she and I became fascinated with this guy who used the Crowley Tarot deck right. in a psychic fair that happened, and we kind of kept tabs on this guy. He was really a bit of a nutcase in the end. Harry Loring Flowers, who went into court and had himself renamed as Volcar. <laughs> And uh, he asked me to visit him his house uh, one, like, Thursday evening. And I went there, you know, hoping there would be a toilet there. I figured he must be, you know, he didn't need one. He was floating in the air. And mm-hmm. I've had that delusionary fantasy for some time after that, too. Not about him, but about others, which I'll <laughs> explain. But he was receiving transmissions from uh, incorporeal entities outside the Earth's sphere, and they can't appear here. And he was writing term papers for them. Mm-hmm. I went back to my mystical professor that both I and Russ's mom also took classes with her, Pat Hunt Perry. Um, she was a fascinating professor who taught a variety of mystical courses. Right. You know, she you know kind of laughed him off politely. And yet those tarot cards seemed more potent than the other decks that people were using. By the time I got out of college, I had already been through several experiences at the Magical Child, where I discovered the Crowley Tarot, I took a course there, and I used to talk to Herman. Uh, Herman Slater was the owner of the Magical Child. Mm -hmm. And I kept asking him about the OTO, and and this is like 1984. Unbeknownst to me, that's the time of the Moda trial. Right. And he's saying, stay away from them right now. You don't want to go near them. And and he would never tell me why. In the meantime, I didn't know they were actually doing services in the back of his store. Mm -hmm. So eventually I found them uh, by attending a a Gnostic Mass in Brooklyn. And I was blown away. I saw this Gnostic Mass and it was like everything that I wanted. It was like super stupid instant conversion. I'd been through these Golden Dawn mail order courses and ARE mail order and I've attended some theosophical lectures. I I went to a very small and intimate uh, Krishnamurti lecture once. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I met some people, some American Indians. I had a great experience with my mysticism professor in the several courses I took with her. And so by the time we get to this Gnostic Mass, that's it. I am your number one OTO fan. These <laughs> guys got it. I'm meeting guys like Jim Wasserman and Kent Finney, and I'm thinking like they don't use toilets either. <laughs> I mean, I'm really completely naive, yet unbeknownst to me, far more well-read than they were. So just last question before the OTO, at school, at college, etc., were you the weird child, or was it just normal for everyone else or for yourself? I was both the weird child and the runt of the pack. Remember, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm smaller stature than most people. I'm you know you're you're short, mini, little, fat Italian guy. But I was skinny when I was young. It just mm-hmm. I, I got uglier. Um, <laughs> I was actually cute when I was young. But anyway, starting a year early meant I was a year younger than my classmates. Sure. So I was kind of extra small, always off on my own. I wasn't talented at sports, though I wanted to be. I'm still an ardent Yankee fan today. If you could give me my fantasy, that would be for me to pitch for the New York Yankee. I had to walk away from a game they were winning for this interview, so you should be grateful. (laughs) <laughs> but I became interested in piano. I became interested yeah. in religious readings, you know, as a child, four years old, six years old, eight years old, ten years old. Interesting. You know, and then I was ahead by the time I got to high school, hair down to my knees, you know, walking around. And, you know, all the jocks hated me and I had to sing with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, back to Gnostic Mass then. So you attended that and that was 86, correct, or a bit before? Approximately 1986, yes. Yeah, right. And it blew you away. You said, uh, how did it compare to the high mass you liked so much the years before? It was everything that I could have liked about the high mass with everything existing in the 20th century instead of the 15th century. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I've been through the whole sexual revolution, drug revolution, everything that you wanted that, you know, that became immortalized of the 60s in the 70s. You know, I was into surrealism in college as the Western mysticism Mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't really feel comfortable with any ideas about Hinduism in the end. When I first read Bhagavad Gita, I really couldn't substitute Krishna for Jesus. If I was going to worship Krishna, I might as well worship Jesus. And and Jesus was conditioned into me and Krishna wasn't. Although I do do remember hanging out at the mall. That was something you did in those days. And I was really after this girl who was a Hare Krishna who was always giving me Hare Krishna books. Yeah, but I, I really had more purian interests for her. <laughs> and the Theosophical Society also was an attraction to you, I think. I went to one lecture. All in right. 1986, I was still living semi-homelessly. Uh, we were squatting in a building that basically didn't have a roof when we started. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, from being put out of my house, going back to was I weird. My my mother decided I was Satan's vicar on earth, both for leaving the church and then doing something so terrible as, you know, graduating college, because <laughs> that meant I could read her mind. Had you read your Crowley by then or not yet? Well, n- now I'm already uh, well into... By the time I joined them, I'm well into the Book of Thoth. I, I re- already started writing my own book on tarot. I was teaching courses on it right. already. You know, that even came about from another person that I had met who helped me through a tough period. So I, ke- I always kept meeting interesting people. And again, by the time I came to the OTO, I was reasonably well read in other things in the Western mystery tradition. It's, you know, it, it's larger literary heritage outside of Crowley. Mm-hmm. And then even, you know, had all the Golden Dawn and BOTA material, went to a theosophy lecture and just over challenged them. And I'm teaching these courses again on tarot. So I'm really self-producing myself, you know, you know, many times by virtue of interesting people that I met along the way that would show me this or that, you know, as I tried to associate with the North Jersey Metaphysical Society and, you know, met other groups, you know, even yeah. the, the group we discovered Harry Loring Flowers at, yeah. at school, was a psychic fair that came to the school. And I got in with, you know, several of the people and got private invitations and things like that. And I guess you, in the meantime, had found out what Kabbalah really was. You know, it's interesting. You know, obviously I start reading Crowley and I'm really learning the Kabbalah really well now. I'm I'm seeing a depth in it that I didn't get out of my tarot studies. The tarot study lays it all out. You know, it's just the tree of life. And, you know, here's the 10 Seth and the 22 yeah. paths and the three pillars. And, you know, the tarot cards correspond to it. So is astrology and good luck. See you later, son. And even these magical orders, the golden dawn, the OTO, the Lemon Quarters, they all teach the Kabbalah as if it was just that. And that's yet a tiny part of the Kabbalah. Yeah, you know, the Book of Thoth opened me up to the fact that it was something much more, but it would take some time before I would fully explore Blavatsky to really get the depth of, of what Crowley was trying to relate. And right. yet I had right. seen all the other literature, the European literature, etc. You know, the Western literature tradition is, you know, Thelema is still but a drop in, in, in its, uh, its corpus. Yeah, sure. So now 1986, you join the OTO, I think. Yes, I joined them. I took, initi- you know, the first four initiations, Minerva, first, second, and third. Mm-hmm. I become their national certification secretary. Mm-hmm. I began to challenge them, and they began to dislike me. Right. That's going to make a long story short. You can read about some of that on Peter Koenig's website. I might put the link on if you agree with me yeah. on, on, on the show notes so that people can do that by themselves. But I'm sure the underlying differences, I mean the spiritual differences – those were the real reason why you decided to go your own way. Can we say it like that? Well, both the spiritual reasons and they interfered in a relationship of mine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I saw that these guys were really just sex, drugs and rock and roll. I was growing way past that. I didn't want to participate in their orgies or their heroin. In one article, I read the sentence that you at that point had a different vision of the eon of Horus. And that's why you went away. Okay, you said it very clearly. But how would you 
say that your vision of the Eon of Horus looks like? What is it for you? I don't remember writing anything that ever said that was the reason for my leaving the caliphate. Um, my reason for leaving the caliphate was the realization that their leaders were fraud. And I would confirm this, joining Hor, replacing one bad idea with another bad idea. Yeah. But I did a lot of study of Moda, and I read the trial manuscripts and everything. And at first I was interpreting it as Moda was the real legitimate good guy in this case, and as I got into Hor. But yeah, I began to see that Moda wasn't necessarily the good guy in this case. Right. Um, there was a lot of problems starting with Crowley leaving the order to Germer. Germer and Moda wanting to really shut the order down because the California Lodge was the only lodge that refused to die. Mm -hmm. And just too many wackos were coming out of it. It wasn't producing initiated people, but producing monsters. You know, then, of course, the whole story with Grady McMurtry, and that has its own legs, too. And, you know, basically the caliphate. Uh, usurped the Crowley copyrights, and bad enough the Crowley kind of usurped his half of the OTO. He really stole it from the other half. What a lot of what I learned from Koenig, and yeah. I gave Koenig a lot of information in these days mm -hmm. or those days. And uh, when all got said and done, even having been through a really terrible AA lineage. You know, I began to understand the Western mystery tradition in its disconnect. The fact that no lineage has ever really survived. There's nothing. Everything's broken, and, and, and it's really Blavatsky that put the Western mystery tradition back together again. Right, yeah. And she was from the Yellow School. She, you know, she was just kind of having pity on the White School because it <sighs> was being emaciated. You know, uh, the the caliphate still tends to the black school. And I still say I'm not talking about the black lodge and people that failed in the abyss that became brothers of the left hand path I'm about the black school, which has its own legitimate claim, but really is the state authorities on the planet today. You know, the, the little wannabes like the caliphate OTO. So, but you know they're 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 certainly dupes of these guys. You hear Wasserman running around talking like a Fox News uh, maniac, you know, and Mister Second Amendment uh, with his whole hidden racism underneath it, you know. So I, I I eventually started my own AA lineage. Right. At the time I left Ray Eels, I was a zealotor, and I realized that there was one sure way to do it was to do the work. And part of Kabbalistic praxis is that you have teacher and student. So I began looking for teachers and began looking for students. Where did you find teachers? So I would meet and, meet and dialogue with people. Um, I had already been through like a few letters to some lineages and I kind of signed on with them, but they were really messed up. They just didn't know what the hell they were talking about and they were making things up as they were going along and, you know, there was just deception and unnecessary mystery and, You know, then I hooked on to a couple of people. Runar was one of them. Runar really helped me through two grades and really opened me up to uh, prophecy and divination mm -hmm. in a way I had not understood before. But eventually it became necessary for us to part our ways. And, you know, I'll leave that to a more private statement than anything else. Sure. Finally, when as Runar was my last AA instructor, you know, I came to realize it's it's about time I give myself credit for the work I've done instead of running around poo pooing half the earth. So it's just my lineage today, and we call ourselves a bootstrap lineage. We haven't produced an adept yet. You know, when we do, we become a legitimate lineage, mm -hmm. but there's a certain legitimacy that we already hold in that we've produced new gnosis where no one else has. And that's what is now called the Gnostic Church of Lux, right? The Gnostic Church of Light, Lux, um, is, you know, certainly one of the vehicles uh, mm -hmm. of this. I, I mean, that's a more public situation than the AA. The AA is, shall we say, more ardent, more strict yeah, with its sure. students looking for a certain caliber um, and ex of exceptional nature. Whereas the Gnostic Church, I think, is more about community. We're not looking for night monks of Thelema there. 
Right. We're looking for people that want to practice Gnosis on whatever level they want to do it and want to form community, understand the cultural conditioning of the church structure, and realize that that's a positive vehicle if used in a positive way. You know, we, we live at a time now where there are a lot of people who, you know, they're in their 30s, they're in their 40s, they're on their ladders at their jobs, rising up to their mid-management positions. They've got the 2.3 kids, the 1.2 car garage, and they want to go somewhere on Sunday and, and continue the tradition of, you know, spiritually charging your batteries. Mm-hmm. But they go to these Christian churches and they're lost. They're, they feel like hypocrites and like they need a shower when they get done, you know. And I'm trying to fill that void. Uh, and we've established something I'm very, very proud of. You know, the first Gnostic church fully owned and operated on the continents of the Americas. Yeah, I read that. That's, that's a rather new achievement, isn't it? It's, uh, I think, a very creative and original achievement. Of course, a few years down the road, either I was really brilliant and creative or a complete idiot. <laughs> we'll find out together. I won't be able to hide it even from myself. <laughs> uh, You'll make a new intro when we have found out. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Uh, you know, I, I'm really trying to build something here that I want to outlive me. I want someday for someone to see a portrait of me on the wall somewhere and say, Mommy, who's that? You know, and Mom's not able to really give an answer. I don't know. Some found <laughs> you know, I, I, um, But now that brings like, me to a question I have put down, and I think it's the right moment now. I know quite a bit about Thelema myself. I'm not a Thelemite myself, but I have had contacts and, and have worked uh, with that as well, so I know a bit. But what has always intrigued me a bit, not being part of it, is this church and mass thing, that you call it church, that you call it mass, and so really, really related to, let's say, Christian backgrounds or Christian terminology better. Why is that? Why do you think it is named like that? Is there a special reason? Oh, yeah, I think there is. I think we can look at it in two ways. Um, first, remember, church is a word that itself literally means community. Yes. And the church becomes the community center. Mm-hmm. The tradition of that is deeply rooted in European and American culture. So you have this on the one hand. On the other hand, recognize the Eucharistic meal that takes place in the Mass. That's the ancient Sethian Gnostics, mm-hmm. long before there were Gnostic Christians. Right. And Thelema most closely imitates Sethian Gnosticism, mm-hmm. right to its Kabbalah. You know, just Seth instead of the Adam Kadmon is that initial hologram from which life you know, generates itself on Earth. I've never seen it like that. Yeah, you're, you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we we practice Sethian Gnosticism in a lot of ways, and we're not necessarily limited to Thelemic scripture, although Thelema and Gnosticism are really two way, two words to say the same thing. You put the community around this instead of these lodges, living room and garage and basement cults. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a, a formal place for people to come, whether in person or online. There we do the formal Eucharistic meal. We do a, a Eucharist of the five elements in our Rosicrucian Mass. Mm-hmm. The Gnostic Mass we leave for private production only. Yeah. You know, we feel that, you know, these people making public events and filming the Gnostic Mass, you know, presents a, a problem in, in um, you know, denigrating the Mass. And I have seen even now Jim Wasserman's video of it, and he who taught me the Gnostic Mass blew the formula of the Eucharist in the Gnostic Mass. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. was incredible. So these films that are out there are even misleading. And, you know, it's, it's really sad to see this, and... It's time to stop profaning the mass, but you know we're not we're never going to be able to stop the caliphate. Uh, they are what they are, uh, at least until their copyrights run out. Additional question to what I just asked: What role is faith playing within that framework? Ah, I like that question. Um, if you ask me what I believe in, I'll tell you I don't believe in a damn thing. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I mean, I have proper beliefs. The sun will rise tomorrow. It's done it for a billion years already. It, yeah. Chances are it's going to be good tomorrow. Probably good. Too. I might believe in a friend or a lover because I have an element of trust there. Mm -hmm. So I have those beliefs. But the superstitious idea of belief in gods. Oh, what do you believe in? Oh, I believe in, you know, that all, all that crap. Uh, there's no place for it in Gnosticism. Yeah, I was going to say because that's exactly the opposite of Gnosticism. Faith. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's diametrically opposed. Yeah. You know, there is that which I know and that which I don't know. And there's a way to getting to what I know when I say something like, I can communicate with the divine. Right. That I don't believe in God. I know God. And I know myself to be God. I know you to be God. I know everything living and inanimate to be God. Mm-hmm. There's no discrimination on the divinity of everyone and everything. Now take this question as a challenge, not as a as a question. I'm just I like to hear you talk about it. That's why I'm asking. Um, <laughs> why do you know you are God? Why do you know I am God and your lover is God, etc.? Why do you know that? How did you find out? Again, the Gnostic process, that internal Gnostic dialogue. As we say in the Rosicrucian Mass, it begins with intuition, and that intuition must be developed so that any knowledge about anything out there, any object, as the existentialists uh, or the phenomenologists would postulate, I know because of an intuition in here. I can stare at that object, whether that be a person or an, ob or an inanimate object. I can stare at that object. I can... You know, analyze it in terms of what I see, what I hear, what I smell, what I touch and taste of it. And I can analyze it for what my reason and my intellectual functions will reveal to me uh, about it. Mm -hmm. But that's coming from the objective, the object, to the subjective, me. In the Raza Christian Mass, we say that any real knowledge of anything is from the subjective to the objective, that the intuition extends out to the object. Right. And there you come to know it. So if I'm going to objectify the ineffable, I know already I have a problem because you can't objectify the ineffable. Yeah. But I certainly use that intuition – to come to, you know, a, a philosophical understanding and then an emotionally held understanding that it reaches the deeper fabric of my neshama, you know, that spiritual force that pervades the ruach, my yes. soul. You know, so I can't give you the reason why if you want oh, an sure. intellectual thing. I fall far short of it. I just say if you do the process, you'll get to here too. And if you think I'm nuts, fine, see you. <laughs> no, no, sure. I, I'm aware that you can't just put it down it's that way but i was interested to hear how you would explain it and i would be curious to know if for you the fact of getting to know those things also has a consequence in your daily mundane life has your approach to day-to-day -day life changed because of the knowledge you gained do you search knowledge in mundane life as well how do they relate to your spiritual life and your day-to-day -day getting on with your job and with your business? From moment to moment, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Right. From the various processes of the morning toilet and eating to exercise and work life to uh, private life, its uh, vicissitudes, I have always seen a change in my consciousness as I've risen through the grades of the AA. Mm -hmm. The way I like to describe it, I remember when I realized I had moved from probationer to neophyte in my psyche. I was walking down the street and I had a vision of feeling every planet and star in the sky, where they were located in that moment. I was studying astrology deeply at this point, and uh, but I, I could feel them. As I was walking down the street, I could point, you know, say, I mean, I probably didn't really know where Mars was in the night sky, but I could point and say, Mars is over there, Saturn is over there, and it, it was that feeling that came yeah. out of my intuition. It you know, makes you part of I, it, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it was mm -hmm. a deep inner connection yeah. that grows. And so even when I'm, you know, uh, pissed off at the driver in front of me because he's an idiot and he just cut me off and he needs to be shot in three different ways. Um, 
you know, I do realize that, you know, that's also me, you know, because I am also an asshole. And, you know, he is still connected to me, even though in this lifetime we will never have reason to connect. And if we met, I'd probably dislike him even more. And yet, fully valuable, you know, spark of God, fully divine in his own way, just try, you know, his lower vehicles are just trying to figure it out. Before continuing with the interview, let's take a musical break. But we stay also here in the company of Paul. Actually, we have him here sitting at home, at his piano, and interpreting a classic of the blues piano repertoire, and kind of singing and humming along in a very personal and relaxed manner. Stormy Monday. Have mercy on me. God has had mercy. Thank you. 
Stormy Monday, originally written and performed in 1942 by Earl Hines and Billy Eckstein, but here in a performance by Paul Joseph Rovelli at the piano and vocals. It often amazes me how many occultists in all kinds of disciplines are also musicians, both professional and not, or they use music and lyrics for expressing their thoughts on the esoteric and the occult. There must be some relationship between music and the occult. Let's now go back to the interview with Paul, where we will talk, among other things, also about his take on scientific illuminism. I always find it very interesting that we, being spiritual beings, and try to achieve gnosis and knowledge and knowing through that, that we want or need to learn so many different things. I think that's fascinating. I love doing that anyway. But what you just described, knowing where the different planets and stars are at that very moment, making you part of the whole thing. I think that's a very special and somehow mysterious and mystical experience. Would you agree? Oh, yes, yes. It was definitely a mystical vision. Yeah. You know, I can give one of those visions for each grade that I transcended in the AA and you know, recognize how well measured the program of the AA really is. You will produce, you know, real and noticeable differences in your consciousness mm -hmm. when you do the grade work as it should be done. Now I have a question for you which I'm not sure you can give an answer to that, but let's try. The OTO, like many other movements of the Western esoteric tradition, have had their origins in Europe or the Mediterranean, so in my part of the world, so to speak. That's also one of the reasons why I do this podcast. And nowadays, especially the OTO, but also other strong movements there, Golden Dawn, etc., are mostly based, located in the United States or North America and have their deep roots there and all that you experience in the 80s and now with your church. I'm not sure it were possible at this time in Europe. Do you have an explanation for that? Do you see reasons for that? Um, yes and no. Okay, on the yes side, you know, I'll, I'll quote that ancient American mantra, go west, young man. Mm -hmm. Europe's greatest explorers and most ardent innovators sought the new world. And when they got to the new world, go west, young man, took them to the gold mining in the California hills in 1849. Yeah. You know, so... Every, the most extensive pioneers really ended up going as far west as they could go before they got east again. I think with that, you know, it's no wonder that California is like this spiritual center right now. Yeah. And it benefits from its closeness to the east, which has become, shall we say, the darling adoptee of the Western mystery tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and... You know, the, the Mexican and Latin American spirituality that comes up through Mexico and in through the islands. Not to mention that, you know, it still feeds on, you know, the Nordic and the North things that come down in through Canada. So, and this area where the Gnostic Church is, is really one of the original motivators of a lot of new thought, from the American transcendentalists to the theosophists to the, the Shakers and the Quakers and the Mormons. The Mormons yeah. All mm -hmm. of that took place in these woods. As a matter of fact, all of the Bible Belt's uh, fundamentalist mentality originated here in the Northeast. Yes. So... This is a place of newness. Uh, the United States Masons would get their charter from Scotland, and they would create an American form of Masonry that really doesn't share that much with with European Masonry, European yes. Masonry in general. Absolutely, whether York or Scottish, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, also uh, that that Masonry died with the Morgan affair. So now Masonry in the United States is little more than a Christian front. So, but. 
then again, to get to the no side, Europe is rich in that culture. Definitely. It's rich, it's ingrained, and I think what Europeans may not appreciate is that it's right in front of them. Yeah. You know, you can run down to the Roman Colosseum if you live in Italy. You can check out Stonehenge in England. You could go to Viking grave sites in the, in the Nordic region. You can, you know, go into Turkey and Istanbul and all that and uh, find things long before you even touch the East. And it's still there. I still do feel personally that Europeans are still better educated in general than Americans. And so there's more people there to attach to the Western mystery tradition in an intelligent manner. Yeah, I don't know if we are better educated, but definitely I would say there is a big reservoir of people who one could interest it in, in the esoteric traditions of the West, yes. Well, there's provincial types all over the world. Remember, as John yeah. Lennon said, you know, we're still pagans after all, you know, yeah. or peasants rather, peasants after all. <laughs> Peasants, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, that's human nature. You have written a book or a series of books, um, which, in my view, uh, are very much at the center of your work, which is called uh, scientific illuminism. I think that describes the whole way of thinking of yours. Could you tell us a bit what is scientific illuminism to you and what should it be to us? Tell us about it. I'm the most proud of that book, uh, although I have some things I'm working on now I think will make me uh, almost as proud. But let me tell you how that came to be written, and I think there's a story in that. When I was still in Hoor and studying with Ray Yields, I had moved down to Tampa to be closer to my spiritual master. Mm -hmm. And in spite of the terrible experience I had down there uh, and, and dealing with you know a, a depressed economy com uh, compared to New York City, which I'd come out of, and I was used to far more and, and again, a bit naive about provincial realms, I, I couldn't afford a car down there. I was hitchhiking home from work one day. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll set the backdrop to that after I tell this part of the story. Sure. Uh, I'm driving along, and I'm not talking to this guy about anything but the weather. It was a beautiful blue sky. We're driving across the bridge from Clearwater into Tampa. And he just blurts out at me. says, you know, I'm a, a lab technician working in a, in a laboratory attempting to cure cancer. And I believe cancer has been cured years ago, but there's just no way to make money off of it. Don't know why he said that. About a year or two earlier, I had come across the idea that cancer was the body's misfired attempt at evolution on a physical level. And I became intrigued with that idea, but I had no idea how to follow through with that in any way. And he says this to me out of the blue, and I kind of dismiss it, but um, I found the experience profound, though I got nothing really out of it. So, make a long story short, as Ray Eels and, and his wife played their manipulations with me, I eventually got a job offer that caused me to move back up north. Yeah. And I went through that whole thing for a couple of years, and I ended up finally working with this piano company. And what I would do is I would go in with a bunch of pianos into a discount center, a Costco, they call it here. Mm -hmm. And... I would sit there for 10 straight days from opening to closing with my pianos. And I generally made my month's money, and so I had the other 20 days off. And this one morning, I'm sitting there. My pianos had to be around 10 or 11 o'clock. And some guy comes along and starts talking to me about his Baldwin piano. And I like Baldwin's a lot. Uh, I'm a particular fan of them. And you know, I told him what he really needed to do, why his piano was valuable, this and that. And we must have chatted for about 45 minutes, and I was just happy to have a, you know, a, a friendly morning conversation and instead of standing there acting silly, which I usually did to attract attention. <laughs> and um, so at the end of this conversation, he turns around to me and says, you've been so good to me, and you knew I wasn't going to buy a piano, so I'm going to offer you something here. I'm a medical uh, artist. I draw uh, biological drawings for doctors and things like that. And mm -hmm. I want you to write this word down. And, and he says, the word is phosphorylation. 
And I'm going to spell it for you so you can find this word. And he says, this is the key to what you've been looking for. Okay. Uh, I didn't bring any of this up. I, he doesn't know me except that I'm a guy knowledgeable about Baldwin Piano. Mm-hmm. I go home. I, I get on the net and I look up that word. Scientific Illuminism and the breviary of the Gnostic Church of Light, the, that series of documents gets written. <laughs> That word unlocked everything for me. I knew what, what I was looking for in cellular biology. I knew what I was looking for in quantum physics. Right. And I've had experiences of quantum physics. I've read certain things. I've discussed things like that in college. and um, But not biology. Cellular biology was a brand new subject for me. You know, I really felt like the secret chiefs were trying to relate something to me you might go to those persons today, they would never remember me. Even if you went to them the next day, probably, they wouldn't have remembered me. Yeah. I really think somebody or something spoke through, through them. You know, how does this guy pique my interest, you know, as if they were trying to knock on my door on that hitchhiking ride in Florida, to this point in North Jersey where I'm sitting in this Costco and this guy gives me the key without knowing, having any way of knowing that I was looking for this key. <laughs> Yeah, well. And I came to understand a lot. I came familiar with uh, Richard and Iona Miller's writings, and they were the first ones to begin to like my ideas. Yeah. And Iona's been a good friend. I've met Richard a, a couple of times, but Iona, we've never met, but we've spoken often to each other. Uh, she's an amazing person. You really should interview her. Uh, so there, and 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 I began to make other connections too that were quite uh, valuable. Uh, Slobodan Skrvik in in Serbia is still a good friend of mine. We don't talk that much, but we've co-written together, mm-hmm. and we share a lot of information on the AA. And you know, there are others that have been good friends of mine now for a long time. You know that that one word really that brought a maturity to my work that I didn't discover right away. I still had a a lot of stupid things to write and say yet. But I think you got to say a lot of stupid things before you learn how to say a few smart things. I think you have to, don't you? Yeah, you do. You have to go. That's the that's the profane side of the abyss somehow. Yeah, or or at least you know the 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 idiocy of the student always precedes the wisdom. Yes, exactly, exactly. Good thing, good thing. Would you be able, for those listeners who have not yet come across scientific illuminism and your work, would you be able to to say in two, three sentences how you would define it? In a nutshell, if you read what these um, physicists are writing when they try to help the public understand what they're doing, Mm -hmm. they're using mystical terminology to explain the relationship uh, between particles and subatomic particles. Mm -hmm. And it's really about time for mystics and mages to start to understand science again. Science is moving away from its uh, devolution into materialism, and it's becoming alchemical again. And this is a key to the restoration of the white school of magic. Right. You know, and we have to start learning the language of science and seeing how our, our grand mystical truths you know, apply even on the material level. And I think my book is really an important first step in us doing that. Thank you for doing it like that now in a nutshell, because I think it is very important for those who have not yet got into that work also to see how science is about to develop and what's important about it and to think about that. I I, I hope many of our listeners will grab that book and delve into it because I think it's, at least to me, it's a very important matter for the future of our planet, of of us, basically. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate hearing that. It it is being well-received by people that have read it. I'm incredibly grateful for the response that I'm getting. Yeah, because I personally see this 
schism between spirituality and materialism, to put it very bluntly. I see it as a danger because it's fake. It's not. It has been there, but it's not really so much of a problem if we want to overcome it. And if we don't overcome it, it will be a problem. I don't know if you would agree with me, but that's my personal belief, well, if you wish. You know, I, I can share that with you in this way. The Western mystery tradition in reality is a study of the liberal arts. Yes. Science, math, art history, aesthetics, theory, uh, philosophy, uh, history, psychology, uh, literature, uh, music, <laughs> sculpture, Absolutely. dance. And for those that finally do get it, their interests will take them to all these things, and the breadth and depth of the mind will be greatly expanded. And that is the way of the white school, to facilitate those individuals that can rise to that challenge. Mm -hmm. The rest will sink into the materialism. That's, all, that's what society offers them. They are, as the Book of the Law says, the slaves that shall serve. They still create the society and the culture for us by running the electric plant and sweeping the floors. So um, that will always be, and they will always be dupes of the black school because the black school works in the opposite manner of the white school. They, their adepts worked to aggrandize themselves, to give themselves the chance at evolution by freeing themselves and empowering themselves with other people's efforts. So the lodges and individuals and spiritual and non-spirituals that are all materialists really – will always serve both the black and the white lodge. Magic versus miracles. I see that question comes up from time to time in your work, if I'm not completely wrong. So, Well, you have a slightly different way of saying it, but I, I can see what you've read. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people just you know think magic is about, you know say the magic word, win 50 bucks. Yeah. There used to be an old Groucho Marx TV show, you know, You Bet Your Life, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if you if any of the contestants said the magic word during the show, he would win fifty bucks. These people get into magic for all the most purient reasons, and they think if they just learn the right words to say, they'll accomplish this supernatural miracle. It's horseshit. It, it's 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 there to make sure that you know people in the white school, uh, you know, can figure out that you're not one of us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, because, you know, it, it, it's the same delusion of belief and faith that, you know, the exoteric religions practice. It's just for, you know, extra special egotists and people with other psychic dysfunction so they can pretend that they're potent when their lives are, you know, meaningless bouts of impotence. And, and I don't have any nice way to say that. I was going to say a clear word. <laughs> But that's really what it is. So they're, they're all yeah. running around saying the magic word. And they're like, oh, I made this demon appear, and I'm Lucifer's friend. <laughs> and, you know, it's uh, you know, it's like, okay, see ya. <laughs> yeah. No, I see w where you're going. Yeah. But I, and I also like that comparison. Belief face, indeed, this is a, a, a pair of words that, uh, that compare well to that magic versus miracles question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Magic is the practice of wisdom. Yeah. You know, it's the, the, the practice of understanding the world and the self through each other. Yeah. You know, and any uh, physical, material things that you might be able to manipulate would just be the result of applying a science. You know, and if you yeah. think it's just about saying the magical word, well, you know, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn for sale. I'll give it to you for a dollar. It comes with a toll booth. And you have to repair it from time to time. Yeah, you have to repair it from time to time. You get lots of quarters. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people nowadays who are in spiritual work and who are interested, genuinely interested and very seriously workers, do solitary work. And then, of course, you have those groups like yours or others, um, and many do group practice. Do you see both possible at the same level? Is group practice better than solitary practice? Where's for you the main challenge or the main differences between the two? 
Both are absolutely necessary. You're not practicing Kabbalah if you are not receiving the light and then transmitting the light. Mm -hmm. Whether you do that in a magical lodge, a church, a lineage, as an author, or what have you, as an artist, a performer, a researcher, um, however you decide to do it is, is you know, in accordance with your own nature. But you must do group work. You, you know, the Kabbalah is a praxis. It's not just something that you learn. Yeah. And part of that praxis is receiving the light into your own empty vessel, ma- made empty to receive the influx of spirit, and then communicating and transmitting that spirit to others. And usually that light only comes because of the presence of the group, right? Of the egregore or... Well, there, the group develops an egregore, and we can get into all sorts of theories on that, but that would really be more a sidebar. Mm-hmm. Now, you're of no use to the group if you're not doing your own individual work. You have to receive yeah. the light. The group ain't going to give it to you. you know. Uh, and the, the transmission is really by association. And, you know, I've noticed how great people are always in association. Whether we talk to Cabaret Voltaire, who hung out in cafes at Fran, in, in France, and mm-hmm. you know they drank their absinthe, uh, the Surrealists did their thing, the Dadaists did their thing, the Cubists did their things, there were playwrights and sculptors and musicians. Mm-hmm. You know, or we go to the American Transcendentalists, who all, all, all hung out at, uh, uh, at Ralph Waldo Emerson's house in Maine. You know, and and yet they spread out through the young United States in those days, and and sought to create an American religion that was free of European element. You know, they they failed in one way and succeeded tremendously in another. The beatniks, the hippies, all of these groups, individuals arose out of the small collective society. And, you know, that's another reason for the church itself. I'm looking for people who are ready to transmit their own genius, you know, onto the pinnacle of the earth. You know, and I don't care that that, that means, you know, you're going to be the best dentist you can be. Paul, unfortunately, we are getting close to the end of this interview. But you mentioned something when we started talking about scientific illuminism, that you had some new venture or no you plan, so I don't know how you would like to call it, coming up. And I hope you're going to tell us a little bit, as much as you can. I've got the first manuscript in semi-typed and semi-handwritten draft on my desk right now. Mm -hmm. It's a three-volume set that, you know, I'm calling uh, Theosophy and Thelema. Okay. And I'm going to do a, a, an intensely articulate comparison between first the secret doctrine, which is the doctrine document on my desk, mm-hmm. then um, Isis Unveiled, and then finally uh, Blavatsky's Zohar, mm-hmm. the, uh, Theosophical Zohar. And uh, I'm putting it out as, as a three-volume set, and, I'm gonna, and I'm, as soon as I get time, I'm going to begin to type up the, the first volume, because I've got it kind of written. Uh, and I really, you know, what I came to discover was the, you know, Crowley's knowledge of the Western mystery tradition came from Blavatsky. I mean, not, he was, she wasn't the only source, but it was her wisdom that infused the inner order of the Golden Dawn. And that stuff got lost to most of its exponents. I was going these. to say, unfortunately, not many people still remember that. Yeah. And if if there are others that ever came out of there that knew it and remembered it, they wrote nothing. Crowley was the only one that, you know, kind of braved the world and wrote about this. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's all really brief sideline mention in, in the Book of Thoth. It's time to bring the Western mystery tradition back to people's awareness. You know, and I think Thelema is the modern expression of that tradition. Mm-hmm. So I show how that which was ancient is, you know, inculcated into Thelemic doctrine. You know, and Blavatsky was a marvelous mapper of our history. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that with us and that plan. And I'm very excited to hear that and that our listeners can also know about it. Any idea when you think at least the first volume is going to be ready to be published? I am hoping to see it come out soon, but... uh, (laughs) I, I don't know whether I'm going to get to actually typing it uh, next week or next month or, you know, in the middle of the summer. So we keep uh, fingers uh, crossed it soon. 
Yeah, I got a new job and um, teaching piano at night, and so like Monday to Friday are like shot. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners and myself we know the feeling. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I'm very glad we had that hour together and we could chat and have a nice exchange. I learned lots and lots from you. Thank you so much. Appreciate uh, I appreciate the interview. Uh, thank you. Speaks you some other time, I hope. Thank you for your time. This was Paul Joseph Rovelli on Thoth Hermes podcast. Interesting interview indeed. Thank you again, Paul, for your time and sharing very openly about your point of view on your life and your experiences. This interview gave me personally a lot of new and deep insight. It often amazes me how different many occultists see certain aspects of our and their work. Individualism seems to be a very important factor in the esoteric traditions. And as we all, like in the arts world, are speaking about very subjective and often not measurable matters, this leaves a broad path open to controversy and opposing opinion. Paul and many others have made their own experiences with this. To me personally, as a mostly solitaire worker, it is always interesting to find out how far the individual aspect can and must go to reach our goal, but also when and how much you need your group, your egregore, for support and for joining forces to get where you would like to. Fascinating, I find. The News before and during the interview, Paul and I mentioned a website about Thelema and the OTO, proposed and maintained by Peter Robert Koenig. This website is not really new, but I want to use the opportunity to present it here to our listeners. For those of you who are interested in Thelema and the OTO, and have not yet discovered it, it is a real must. Under the title The Ordo Templi Orientis Phenomenon, a research project, Swiss author Peter Robert Koenig brings us the most extensive online collection of documents, historical facts, images, names, etc. on Thelemic history that I know about. You can find the website under www.parareligion.th and also the link is in our show notes. From Crowley to Rudolf Steiner, Theodore Royce, Karl Germer and Gregor Gregorius, they are all there. As Koenig points out himself, this is a documentation of the behavior of the participant parties. And here is a further definition by the author Koenig himself. A detailed historical field research on the psychosociology of a modern secret society called Ordo Templi Orientis. All about modern-day occultism and money, so-called Templars and falsification of history, Gnostics in the kitchen and bedrooms, and their expanded consciousness. Illuminati and conspiracy, neo-Rusicrucians, religious liberty and sex magic, their relation with voodoo and Freemasonry, rituals, correspondences, books and articles. End quote. When you go on this site, do take your time. It is not structured like most modern websites would be, so you will need some time to search around. But what a massive collection, which will keep you busy for many hours without ever getting bored. Remember my review of Peter Mark Adams' great book, 
The Game of Saturn, about the Sola Busca Taroki, which I posted in episode 3? Well, due to the huge success of this book, the publishers, Scarlet Imprint, have decided to do something which does not happen so often there. They have now issued a paperback version of this book in their Bibliothèque Rouge edition, which will make this important work available to more readers and interested occultists. Also, stay tuned on Scarlet Imprint's website for the release of the Sola Busca Taroki cards. If they can keep the print quality they reached in the hardcover edition of The Game of Saturn, and I'm rather sure they can, this can be a spectacular object for collectors of tarot decks. Scarlet Imprint announced two days ago that they will soon start to take pre-orders, so be aware. And now, as our last piece of music for this episode... I will play for you a short improvising session on a four-track machine, performed by Paul Joseph Rovelli and the then new Joy band member and guitarist Keith Carrigan, recorded in 1995. My brother. My son. My brother. Love. My brother. These are the first words. Stealing the bread from my mouth. I would say to you. Why should I cry for you? Greet the brightness of this new light. The junkie. Let it burn away. Self-made. The unconsciousness of your birth. Unpaid. Lay a claim. Killed your mother. By challenge to your birthright. Sold your soul. Spent my bread. Eat my money. If only to swallow it. Living the dream, my brother. Cold from the netherworld, my brother. As a shadow of night, you have defied Hades and the gods of the abyss. Ate my money to wrap in wonders. In this dreamy sun, your mother. I claim you my own, my creation. And long I yearn for the day. To your own trumpet, why should I cry? And your own enchantment, you are God of my God, wine of my wine.
Paul Joseph Rovelli and Keith Carrigan, improvising together in 1995. Books and other reviews. Today, I would like to present to you a new book with the title The Book of Gates, a Magical Translation by Josephine McCarthy, Michael Shepard and Stuart Littlejohn. When I receive a book written by Josephine McCarthy, I must admit that I'm a bit positively biased. I have enjoyed everything that she published so far, and when I opened the Book of Gates for the first time, I knew that this would just be another addition to the row. The Book of Gates is an ancient Egyptian magical funerary text related to the much better known Book of the Dead. But this one is meant at the same time for the living and for the dead, talking about a magical and mystical journey through the underworld, thus transforming the soul for adepthood. Strangely enough, this text, the Book of Gates, was so far largely unknown. I was expecting to receive a smallish book with some illustrations, but to my surprise, what I got is a full-scale 22 on 29 centimeter hardcover with 350 pages full of interesting magical content. In fact, Josephine is not the only author. The ancient texts from Egypt were translated by Michael Shepard, who did an excellent job in my view. Of course, I would not be able to judge the quality of the translation itself, but what he has given us are texts full of inspiration, power and tenderness at the same time. Josephine McCarthy has written extensive commentaries on the different sections of the translated original text, helping us to understand this world and its magical context better and leading us to use these texts for our own practice. She is again doing what she is unique in, linking ancient tradition to a consequently modern approach, making it clear that magic always lives in two eras at the same time, when it was conceived and written, and when it is practiced. Last, but certainly not least, I need to mention the beautiful illustrations by Stuart Littlejohn. They add a very important aspect to the quality of that book, and to me, they are more than just illustrations, but rather doorways for meditation on the texts. Stuart Littlejohn happens to be the featured artist on the Toth Herbie's website at the moment, so go there and have a look. Ancient Egypt has always been important to me, from history class to my magical work. So this book is definitely exciting for me. But it is much more than that. I believe it is at the same time interesting to practicing magicians, historians, lovers of deep lyrics, and almost everyone working and interested in the Western mystical path. The Book of Gates was published by Korea Publishing UK, that rather new venture that has also brought the excellent Korea New School of Magic for the 21st century to us. While I'm mentioning this, my friend Greg Kaminsky and I have recently interviewed Josephine McCarthy and Michael Shepard about this course, so it might be a good idea to go and listen to that episode on Occult of Personality, which has been released just a few days ago. And this, dear friends and listeners, is the end of today's episode, which was episode number six of the Thos Hermes podcast. Thank you for having tuned in. It is always a great pleasure to have you with us. Episode 7 will be our next issue, and it should come to you in about two weeks. As I said, 
The exact release date will be made available to you via your subscription email, Facebook or Twitter. So, if you have not subscribed yet on either of those choices, now might be a good moment to do so. Our featured guest on episode number 7 will be renowned author and lecturer, California-based Benabel Wen. Her two books, The Holistic Tarot and The Tao of Craft, as well as her rather unique website with a lot of supplementary material, have made her one of the most important specialists in tarot today and a bridge builder between the Eastern and Western traditions. Don't miss this one, it will be very interesting. I do hope you enjoyed listening to us today. We are always striving to bring you new knowledge, new ideas and interesting background information on subjects you might already be aware of. Wendy Rule is calling this episode to an end with Night Sea Journey, so I will have to let you go. Take care, stay tuned, hear you soon. Nothing can stop